There are Jewish literary sources that actually say that, that God came down on the mountain and gave Moses the Ten Commandments on Pentecost. And that's 50 days. Yeah. The entire Exodus is one big messianic prophecy. You know, I'll call my son out of Egypt. It's applied to Christ. We've got the crossing of the Red Sea, being baptized into Moses. The serpent on the pole and Jesus in John 3 just said, that was a messianic prophecy of me. The Jews at that time looking forward, it was a mystery, but we Christians looking back, we can see it and the 50 days from Passover to Mount Sinai where it connects the important messianic synchronism with God giving the law of Moses on Pentecost and in Acts chapter two. The church getting the law of Christ on the day of Pentecost through the mouth of Peter. I find this connection between the Old and New Testament fascinating, where the God of the universe comes in fire to meet his people. And in these divine and holy connections, there's worship. I've just made a film called uh, The Journey Home. And in that film, we've had scenes where we've picked the select verses from the Exodus. And I'm seeing that there's a connection in our own lives that, you know, we're called out of bondage and we're called to meet God. And through that process, we go through some really difficult situations where we wonder if we're going to die, <laughs> you know, uh, trapped at the sea, but God rescues us. So for each one of us, we go through that. But what's the spiritual lesson you think is being taught uh, I think there's many, but about this journey, about when God says, I'm calling you to go do something, and people say, I don't think I can trust that, or I'm afraid. It's very clear from the New Testament. I'm thinking 1 Corinthians 10 or Hebrews chapter 3, both of which are reflecting on these wilderness journeys where Israel fell due to lack of faith, fell due to idolatry, a failure to trust in a big God who is always trustworthy, unchanging, and has absolute control over all things. The call for the Christian is to read these stories and to feel the weightiness of God is trustworthy. In the midst of this trial, he is not leaving me. He is able. Israel, once they arrived at Kadesh, 10 spies only could see giants. Two of the spies, Joshua and Caleb, saw all the opportunity and their gloriously big God. Mm -hmm. These spies, after only a year since God defeated all the gods of Egypt and brought them through the waters of the Reed Sea, they forgot so quickly. And the challenge for us all is to not forget, but to remember that God has been faithful in our past and let those reminders fuel our faith even in the present, even in seasons of darkness. Moses had said that a prophet like me will come and to whom you shall listen. I will send you a prophet, said God through Moses, mm -hmm. like me, to him you shall listen. And the prophet like Moses in even as in a nativity, even in the background of his birth, even in his flight to Egypt, coming back from Egypt and so on, is a prophet like Moses. And who would that be? Well, that's the Lord Jesus himself, of course. I mean, he stood on the Mount of Transfiguration, shared with Moses and Elijah, the representatives of the law and the prophets, and talked with them about his exodus that he would complete and fulfill in Jerusalem. The word in Luke says he talked with them about his way out, his exodus, exodus in Greek. So Jesus was sharing with Elijah, who was the great prophet, speaking about the forerunner and whatnot, the so-called forerunner, and with Moses, that he had come, and that actually is the only instance that Moses was allowed in the Holy Land. 
when the Lord Jesus wanted to talk to him. You see, but, but you see, the Lord Jesus shared about it with Moses and Elijah that he would be the fulfillment of all this. So he is a prophet like Moses. And if you look at the features of Moses' birth, hardly born, persecuted, rescued from death through a flight. <laughs> and if you look further, how did Moses actually enter Egypt for victory? Have you ever read the story how Moses arrived in Egypt? He took his wife, mm -hmm. put her on a donkey, one son in hand, one son on the donkey, and went into Egypt. Now, there is, there is a man, 80 years old, with a relatively younger wife and two kids, on a donkey, arriving in Egypt to tell the world tyrant, the strongest ruler with the strongest army, with the best equipped culture and whatnot, to tell him, let my people go, otherwise you'll be destroyed. How did Jesus arrive in Jerusalem for his victory? I believe he was on a donkey, wasn't he? He was on a donkey, yeah. The king arrived and he came on a donkey. And a week later, he had conquered. You see, believe it or not, a prophet like me. And if you like some of the things that, that Moses did, that they had, uh, about all the miracles that God did, and in consequence, and later on through Elijah, you're right in the gospel. And Jesus just reproduced what he had done before in his pre-incarnation time. Uh, he was the word incarnate, came to fulfill. Already, Moses and his audience were seeing the Exodus as a type or picture of greater deliverances to come. If God overcame the greatest enemy, will he not also do everything else we need to carry us to glory? And this is why the prophets are able to use the Exodus as a pattern for a greater Exodus. They'll talk about a second Exodus that is to come and they associate that second Exodus with the Messiah. So then in Luke chapter 9, when Moses and Elijah show up on the Mount of Transfiguration, it says explicitly in the Greek text, they spoke about Jesus' Exodus. Now, many translations will just use the word departure, but it's the only place in the entire New Testament where the term Exodus actually shows up. And they're referring to his death, burial, and resurrection in Jerusalem. This is where Jesus will accomplish freedom from slavery for all who have been bound to sin. And it's a key element that would be missed. The miracle of Jesus' deliverance of sinners is anticipated in the Exodus itself, in this divine work that could not be accomplished by anything in nature. So it's important for us to see it as a miracle because it not only takes the Bible on its own terms and makes much of a big God who is worthy of glory, it also makes much of his son and the work that Jesus would do in the New Testament age. What Jesus does at the cross is defeat the ultimate serpent king who was embodying himself in the life of Pharaoh. You have in the book of Exodus all the basic patterns of what theology is all about, what salvation is all about, what sanctification is all about, and what civilization is all about. So what kinds of patterns are you seeing in the book of Exodus? Each major theological term about God, his character, and about salvation is interpreted in the book of Exodus. Without these terms that recur through the whole of Scripture, 
and are finally fulfilled in the life of the Lord Jesus. But you don't know what the Lord Jesus Christ has fulfilled if you don't know the root terms in the book of Exodus. Hmm. Like what? Like salvation, like reconciliation. <laughs> look, look into, into Exodus uh, where God tells Moses what he will know after the Exodus is finished. You see, God explains to Moses what will happen. Then the Lord said to Moses, now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh, for under compulsion he shall let them go, and under compulsion he shall drive them out of his land. God spoke further to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord, Yahweh. I am the Lord, and I appear to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty. But my name, Lord, I did not make myself known to them. Of course, they knew the name Yahweh, but they didn't know what it meant. Mm. They knew God as God Almighty, but they didn't know God as Yahweh, who He really was. And I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Cana and the land in which they sojourned. And furthermore, I have heard the groaning of the sons of Israel because the Egyptians are holding them in bondage and I have remembered my covenant. Say therefore to the sons of Israel, I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the burden of the Egyptians and I will deliver you from their bondage. I will also redeem you with an outstretched arm and with a great judgment. Then I will take you for my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the burden of the Egyptian. And I will bring you to the land which I swore to give to Abram, Isaac, and Jacob, and I will give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. These terms are the basic terms of the whole concept of salvation. From paying the price for them, for bringing them out under the burden. Now, if you go into the details of these words, that would be a full lecture. I normally need two lectures for these terms. You have all the terms of basic theology that remain the same through all the prophets, go into the New Testament, are the key terms for the Apostle Paul, for Apostle Peter, and whatnot. And they're all fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, to pull you out from under the burden actually is a tremendous word. It means I will pull you out, the chains will be lying on the floor, and you will be free. Mm. And the chain holders will sit there with their chains so they have to throw them around the necks of the next. But you will be free. I'll take you out. I'll pay the price for you. I'll redeem you. I, I, I pay for you. I'll deliver you. I bring you into a new life. And I will be your God. I'll accept you. It's the deepest term of love. You will be my accepted people. So uh, if you miss those terms, you would not know how to translate the New Testament. When I've been through this book with my Bible students, they have a new Bible in their hands, a new understanding of their life, a new understanding of the processes of their salvation, and a new sense of belonging. And then they start reading the New Testament and they suddenly see light. They suddenly see, ah, that's mm. what what meant. That is really it.